Welcome everybody to the January webinar on the, of the conference on reproducibility and replicability in economics and social sciences. Uh, I'll, I'll start with introducing a bit what we have been doing and what this whole webinar series is about. We've so far had uh, four webinars on a series of discussions by specialists and practitioners on the topics of reproducibility, replicability, and transparency. This is the fifth one. Um, our panels in general discuss educational and procedural barriers slowing down adoption, whether journals or institutions or funders should be verifiers of reproducibility, whether and how scientists' work can be made to be reproducible at every stage of the research process, including at inception, at data collection, at a publication, and the implications thereof for the training of undergraduate and graduate students. So we want to sort of cover the whole time series. Uh, check out the previous webinars. They're all recorded and available on YouTube um, on the press website, which should be showing up in the chat. Okay. Um, I also want to uh, introduce uh, Alex Mishuda, who's here on screen. He's the co-PI of this project uh, and a member of the organizing committee. And uh, Marie Canoli, who's online as well, and Ian Schmuddy, who is not here today, who are members of, of my organizing committee and help us uh, sort of organize this whole thing. Um, and they may be hosts of some of the future webinars. And Sarah Brooks, uh, who keeps the wheels rolling, she's controlling this, all of it, um, as we move forward. Okay, They'll be on mute for most of the panel, but Alex and Sarah will be monitoring the chat, so please post any questions um, in the chat, uh, or the QA, rather. Um, so, I really hope you'll enjoy, I think you will enjoy today's webinar on reproducibility. Why is it not uniformly required across disciplines as sort of this uh, tentative question? Um, we're going to start with each panelist giving a small brief statement, about 10 minutes, uh, followed by a podium discussion, uh, us amongst ourselves, uh, but possibly informed by the questions you ask in the uh, QA. Uh, and at about the 40 minute mark, we'll turn to those questions that haven't yet been addressed from the Q&A, uh, and we'll pose those questions on your behalf to the speakers. Uh, so with that, let me introduce today's uh, panelists. Uh, Kim Whedon, um, my colleague at Cornell, uh, Jan Rock Zubrov, professor of the social sciences and director of the Center for the Study of Inequality at Cornell University. Uh, Kim studies inequality in advanced industrial societies and how it is changing over time. Uh, Hilary Hoynes, Professor of Economics and Public Policy and the Haas Distinguished Chair in Economic Disparities at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, she also directs the Berkeley Opportunity Lab. And as an economist, she works on poverty, inequality, food and nutrition programs, and the impacts of government tax and transfer programs on low-income families. And joining us in a bit, uh, not yet here, is Betsy Sinclair, a Professor of Political Science at Washington University in St. Louis. Uh, her research interests are in American politics and political methodology with an emphasis on individual political behavior. My name is Lars Villahuber, um, so I'll, I'm the moderator here. Um, I'm uh, going to uh, corral this, this discussion, um, which can get lively um, when we're offline anyway. Um, so let me start by asking a, a question to Kim. You and I have discussed this, uh, the kind of history and support are two disciplines, you in sociology and me in economics. Uh, how each of them have given to reproducibility, uh, the emphasis um, in particular quantitative reproducibility. You also co-founded a journal, Sociological Science, that although you're no longer on the editorial board, you're still involved with that, recently announced a requirement uh, for any publication to actually deposit replication packages. So also moving in that direction. Um, shout out to Cristobal Young and, and Vita Malarani, who are also at Cornell and who are on the editorial board at this time. So question, what is the current state of support for reproducibility in sociology? Yeah, thanks very much. Um, I would uh, characterize sociology's um, progress as slow and half-hearted, um, probably a crawl, perhaps glacial. Um, and what I want to do in my little 10 minutes here is to just try and give you a sense of what I think is going on. Um, I should say that this is informed by very little data, um, just my impressions of, of my discipline and and what those conversations actually look like. Um, I wanna sort of tie this in a little bit to my experience with sociological science, um, which was founded, uh, we started working on, I think in 2017, uh, we being a group of five of us, um, most with some prior connection to Stanford, but there were MIT folks and Harvard folks and, and Cornell folks and so forth involved. Um, we were really quite annoyed 
um, with our major disciplinary journals, um, one of which is owned by the University of Chicago and one of which is, is the sort of flagship journal for the American Sociological Association. Um, I think less about their policies or, or um, perspectives on open science, but more some editorial um, issues that were going on. So we really decided that we wanted to provide a different model um, for the discipline to publish general interest uh, papers that advances advance the, um, the science of sociology. Um, and in particular, we were focused a lot in um, the editorial process itself. So some of the innovations that we brought in were things like no revise and resubmits. Um, we guaranteed authors 30 days to the first decision, um, which was up or down. Um, the trade-off was that we didn't require our reviewers to actually give developmental reviews. So it's more of a um, evaluative rather than a development review. Um, and we also wanted to play around with um, actually having open access um, as opposed to a subscription model, all these sorts of things. Um, and what I'm intentionally not mentioning here is implementing a policy on reproducibility. We did actually discuss quite early in the journal's founding whether we wanted to be the first mover in that respect too, uh, with, um, in, in terms of the landscape of sociological publishing. Um, but we really decided at that point that we had other priorities, other ways that we wanted to um, push forward uh, what was going on in the discipline in terms of publishing. Uh, but also, we, quite frankly, we were a little bit concerned that being too radical and too different from the other top journals would mean that it would be hard for us to attract the types of, of submissions that we really wanted to attract, um, including qualitative papers, right? So sociology, as I'll talk about, has this real split between qualitative and quantitative. Um, there are disproportionately more quantitative papers in the discipline, uh, but nonetheless, there's, there's a very long tradition of qualitative research too. So it's kind of a, um, a, a big tent discipline methodologically. We also had a budget of precisely zero dollars. Um, we continue to have a budget of precisely zero dollars. Um, and this kind of affected uh, what we wanted to take on. In particular, the thought was, well, if we're going to require um, authors to, uh, to give us replication packages, what are we going to do with them, right? Um, and, and so we just sort of decided to punt on that particular issue um, I think for about the first oh five years of the journal's existence, um, we're extraordinarily proud that now sociological science has managed to launch into the top five in terms of impact factor in the field. Um, and in fact, I think the last I checked, we're actually third in the field, uh, which for a journal that's you know seven eight years old is is pretty astonishing progress. Um, so we're at this position where um, we're less concerned about recruiting papers basically, um, and we've now. Uh, recently turned our attention to try and saying, okay, what's the next thing we want to tackle? Um, and we, we decided it would be one of these um, requirements now for, for reproducibility packages for quantitative articles. We are not requiring them for qualitative articles, and I'll talk about why here, here in a second. Um, as, it, as I said, the budget is still zero dollars, uh, so we don't have, um, and, and all of it is run off of volunteer labor of, of people who are uh, professors and deans and whatnot. Um, so we don't have anyone on staff who is actually checking the packages um, for the quantitative papers. We're sort of doing it on an honor system, but at least now the authors have to at least give us a link to um, a package, which is in some sense a, a big step forward for um, a general interest journal in, in the field. But I think that, you know, the more interesting question is, is perhaps why hasn't sociology uh, moved further on in this, in this direction of reproducibility and replicability? Um, and in particular, why hasn't the ASA, the American Sociological Association, led the charge? Um, and I studied organizational sociology in grad school in addition to inequality. So I'm going to give you a little bit of an organizational sociology story here. Um, and one of which is about the organization itself. Um, you know, like most of these professional membership organizations, there's a, a full time and permanent staff. Um, and then there's sort of elected uh, people who float in and out of various uh, positions whether they're leadership positions or, or positions on various committees and so forth. Um, the publications committee has uh, historically been, um, it, it, it's an elected position. It's a fairly short term um, of, of tenure of, of each member. Um, my sense is that it has been relatively weak um, in terms of actually adopting and pushing forward new policies. Um, it's very skilled at doing things like choosing the next editor for a journal. 
um, but not necessarily actually driving forward on, on policies. Um, and the editors themselves um, in sociology, they're not paid. Um, they typically, uh, if they're lucky, they might get a course release from their institution, um, although increasingly that's difficult to get anything from their institution. Um, and typically editors are chosen, particularly for the general interest journals, more um, on other sorts of priorities than their position or their platform on, on open science. Um, so for a while, there was a kind of a, you could tell that all of the candidates for editorial positions for the major journals were really focused on actually trying to, um, I'll just say it, copy sociological science and, and what we were doing in terms of decision times and, and really uh, trying to cut down on, on decision times and the number of uh, rounds of reviews that papers were going through, um, which are you know, very valuable sorts of things to, to do as a journal, but not kind of pushing forward on, on reproducibility. There's also enormous resource constraints at the, at the ASA as there is in, in, I think, many of these membership organizations. Um, but I think that the other key point about what's going on in sociology really has to do with the nature of the discipline itself. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, qualitative research is a, is a fairly substantial component, um, both historically and the present day, um, part, of, part of the discipline. Um, in some sense, I think it's actually increasing in prominence within the discipline uh, for a variety of reasons that aren't entirely relevant to this, to this panel. Um, and I think that there are real and genuine concerns about reproducibility of qualitative research that tend to slow down progress toward even implementing reproducibility as a criterion for getting a quantitative research paper published. Um, and what, what are some of those concerns about reproducibility and qualitative research? I mean, I think they're probably familiar to, to many of you. Um, I'm going to lay out three uh, concerns that I think have been raised. Um, and I should preface my comments by saying I'm not a qualitative researcher myself, so I'm kind of a, a, an outsider looking in at that part of the field. Um, but one of the concerns is really that uh, there's a very strong sense of ownership of qualitative data. Um, and again, I'm going to tell you an institutional story about why that's the case. It's not that qualitative researchers just don't want to share. Um, it's just that there's a long, long um, absence of funding within sociology to collect qualitative data as a, as a public good. Um, you contrast that with things like the General Social Survey, which has been, a, I think it's now a $5 million operation each year um, that uh, has been going on since 1972. In some sense, that has created this public good of a quantitative um, oriented data set. Um, that has allowed researchers to, you know, to use those sorts of data um, that are out there and they're, they're readily available. Um, an analog doesn't exist in the qualitative space. Instead, what you have is individual PIs uh, collecting qualitative data, often on incredibly shoestring budgets, you know, one or two thousand uh, dollars to collect a qualitative data set. Um, there's simply kind of one of the trade-offs here is that you almost have to give ownership to those data. Um, if somebody's going to uh, actually take the time and, and um, hassle of investing a lot of time in collecting a qualitative data research um, data project with, without any institutional support or monetary support, you kind of have to give them something in return. And that something in return has essentially been ownership. So there's that issue. There's the intellectual property ownership issue. Um, I think there's a lot of discussion now among qualitative researchers themselves about this question about whether reproducibility is possible for qualitative research. Um, it tends to be um, much more iterative. Um, it's interpretive. It's often inductive. Um, it's intersubjective um, in the sense that even if you were given the same transcript um, and or even the same video ev evidence, two researchers wouldn't necessarily come to the same conclusions about what those data meant. Um, there's also a concern about deductive disclosure if you're going to publish raw data, um, even if it's anonymized. Um, there's the risk that outsiders could identify particular members of the community, but also that people within a community that's being studied could could recognize each other based on based on what's been published about them in terms of the raw data. Um, and then there's thirdly, so there's the intellectual property issue. There's the uh, is reproducibility possible for qualitative research? And there's, there's also the question about whether that's even the right goal for qualitative research. So there are lots of folks who would say things like, well, first of all, when you're going to share the data, share qualitative data, say video evidence or a transcript or whatever it might be, 
um, you have to disclose that you're going to do that, and that's actually going to change the behavior of the participants themselves, right? So this is a classic Hawthorne effect, um, only for qualitative research. Um, there's also a concern that this is going to lead to um, non-random selection out of being a participant in qualitative research, right? So people who are kind of understand how this game works, um, perhaps the elites in a particular organization or the public officials, they're gonna basically take themselves out um, and say, no, I'm not gonna participate because it's, I, I can't be guaranteed of confidentiality or an anonymity. Um, and then finally, there's, I think perhaps a little bit more of a, of a radical position, which is um, represented by a, a scholar by the name of Stenbaka in 2001. Um, and the quote here is, if a qualitative study is discussed with reliability as a criterion, the consequence is rather that the study is no good. So there's this, this idea that when you're chasing after reliability or replicability um, or reproducibility as a qualitative researcher, you're probably not doing qualitative research very well. Um, I think that's a, a fairly extreme view, um, but I mention it partly because I think that this is part of the conversation that's going on around reproducibility and sociology today is how do you create a system um, where uh, there's clarity in who should be covered, um, who, who is sort of subjected to requirements of submitting a replication package, for example, and who is not. Sometimes that's very clear, um, but there are mixed method studies in sociology that's sort of a combination of quantitative and qualitative, and then it becomes a little bit less clear what those what those requirements should be. Um, so I think that's part of the story. It's the discipline itself that's, that's the issue, um, but it's also a, a kind of a, a weak core or a big tent um, to the discipline itself, if you want to look at it that way. Um, it's sort of the, the inertia of the American Sociological Association from a variety of reasons. Um, and it's also this kind of um, inertia within the journals themselves about, about where it is that they should be focusing their energy in, in improving their processes and so forth. So I think I'm gonna stop there. I'm not sure how I am on time, but um, I'm looking forward to hearing the other panelists and to all of your questions. Thanks. I definitely have a few questions, comments, and this would probably take more than just the time that we have at the end of this. So um, we'll, we'll want to get back to that. Thank you. Um, that was very informative um, and, and very interesting and sets the stage for some of our discussion later on. Okay, let me switch to Hillary. Uh, Hillary, you had slides, so if you want to bring them up. Um, so um, I invited Hillary to, to, to this panel in part because... Um, she was part of the AA committee that was mandated to search for a data editor and ultimately selected me. So I want to learn a bit about what the state of the process was before that happened. Um, so what was the background to that process? Uh, if we were thinking about what Kim just said, was this a top-down process from one of the top journals from the big association that is the American Economic Association? Yeah. Or does it reflect a broad consensus in the discipline that sort of was then reflected in there's a need to do this and there we, we generally accept that. Um, yes, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very, um, very much looking forward to the conversation. Um, I uh, would very much like to, to answer your question. Let me just start by positioning myself and my background a little bit as it relates to uh, the conversation today. So I've done a lot of um, service kind of activities, um, both currently a member of the Committee on National Statistics at the National Academies, and was a member of the uh, Commission on Evidence-Based Policymaking. And I mentioned those two things because I think one of the big um, um, incomplete aspects of where economics is at relates to the very um, incredibly strong growth of using some form of confidential um, proprietary data. And it's a big hole in what we're currently uh, able to do in terms of the um, space that we're talking about in terms of open science. So I mentioned that first. And then um, secondly, I sort of came to this within the journal world, um, having been an, an editor uh, first at uh, at both at American Economic Association journals, um, starting at the American Economic Journal Economic Policy. I was one of the founding editors of that new journal. And then subsequently uh, was for six years, 
one of the editors at the American Economic Review, the flagship journal of the association. And it was when I was in that position um, at the American Economic Review that I co-chaired with Esther Duflo, who was then the, the, um, the, the head editor of the American Economic, Economic Review, this AEA-led search for a data editor that led to our very fortunate hiring um, of Lars. So that's sort of my... Uh, the pieces of this conversation that that I've had um, uh, kind of direct um, uh, experience with. And so in thinking about the different disciplines and, and what I thought I knew about what makes economics different or the context different, I think it's very powerful. It's a powerful um, observation that I think the American Economic Re uh, Association sees itself as having the capacity to be what you'd call like a market leader because they, they have so much, so many of the uh, sort of top journals are currently housed at the American Economic, at Economic Association or Association Journals. So that started with the American Economic Review and um, that journal became so clogged with um, uh, submissions and, and quality accepted papers that they eventually expanded the number of issues um, that they, um, that they you know, printed, quote unquote, printed per year. And that process led the AER, American Economic Review, to kind of occupy a disproportionate share of the articles published in our top five you know, agreed upon top five journals in economics. And then um, because of um, the success of the journals and the budget situation that the association had, which was a very good budget association, we decided to expand and to add some new journals, which now includes a sort of something that's trying to compete with sort of science and these um, short format articles with quick turnaround called AER Insights. And also four um, sort of top field journals to try to occupy the space just below the top five. And those are the AEJ journals. So if you put that all together, there's a lot of the journal space that the American Economic Association sort of runs. And to the best of my ability to kind of remember exactly what happened in the very beginning, it was neither a top down nor a bottom up, but really I think both factors were going on. So I think there was definitely interest in the executive committee. And I think that the head editors of the American Economic Review, both Esther and the editor prior to Esther, Penny Goldberg, were very interested in, in uh, pursuing more open science. Esther comes from a perspective of uh, very much an RCT sort of setting where pre-registration was very common. Um, and so this sort of part of that um, interest in, in open science. But I think there was also a perspective that kind of percolated up from the membership that was both, I think, a response to potentially observing some replication crises in, in other disciplines, other fields. But I think also from the perspective of those of us engaged in training graduate students, having data available for students to work with early is a really uh, seen as a really important tool in training our students. And so the more we could do in terms of the availability of replication, it would have this sort of additional benefit for the process of our you know, sort of education um, mission. And so the AEA did two things initially. And one of them was um, uh, starting an RCT registry, um, the AEA RCT registry. And secondly, more pertinent to this conversation, um, the requirement of posting of data and code um, uh, for the AEA journals. And very much as Kim was talking about the status now um, in uh, the journal that she launched, it was very much a sort of on the honor system kind of situation. But it was felt that this was a good sort of first step. Um, and the view was that not only would this potentially be important for what we could do within our journals, but that we could also have an impact on other uh, parts of uh, the economics journal 
um, space that wasn't um, occurring at the American um, Economic Association. So those things were put in place, and I, I you know, exactly what the timeline is, I, I can't quite remember, but it was a couple of years, and there was a kind of reevaluation of how this was going. And I think that the observation was, it really wasn't going so great. And there were a lot of things that was making the, um, the open science um, goals not being met. Um, so uh, data and code would be incomplete, uh, documentation would be insufficient, it would be difficult for reuse, um, and it wasn't necessarily um, replicable. And upon some investigation of that, there was a, a very clear recognition that you need staff in order to even know um, how well it's going. And that the staff that was um, assigned to this um, job was really more about ticking a box, like some files were uploaded, they look like they're there, or they asked for a waiver and we, uh, we accepted the waiver. And so upon this reflection, and I think you know, a, real, a realization um, that, the, that the AEA budget was, was pretty strong. We, we pay editors for all of our journals. I think actually a pretty fair um, wage for the work. And the view was perhaps we should take the next step to try to hire someone who would work with the journal editors as well as with the AEA executive committee in order to, and I'm the, the, the last bullet are things that I pulled out from the original job description that we posted, uh, collaborate with journal editors and executive committee, design and oversee implementation of strategy for archiving and curating uh, data, promoting reproducible research. And so that of course led to a search for what we called the AEA um, data editor. And I'll say that there was a discussion about whether or not we wanted this individual to be um, a, an academic, an a practicing academic who has skills in this area or whether we just needed to build up more, I guess I would just call staffing. Um, and we looked to, I believe it was the American Statistical Association that had taken the, the first route, uh, a, a kind of a practicing academic researcher who also had skills in open science. And in, we all kind of talked with folks in other disciplines and we thought that that one seemed to be what we needed because we needed someone to both be an architect as well as a manager and implementer because we didn't know what to do. We weren't experts on it. And so that was the decision to hire someone um, like Lars, who well, not a lot of people like Lars, but that are uh, practicing academic researchers who also have the skills um, in open science. And we were looking for someone who was sort of state of the art enough that they could help us move in the direction that you know, like things are obviously moving very quickly and we wanted to not be constantly um, playing catch up. So let me just end by listing what I think are like the next horizon, at least from what I can gather. The first is, and you know, I say this by in part listening to Lars report to the executive committee. I was on the executive committee and then off it. Now I'm back on it as a vice elected vice president. Like are the resources sufficient for the work that we've tasked the data editor to do, number one. Number two is the huge issue about data that is not in the public domain. It's like a little bit of a different version of, of Kim's problem. It's not about qualitative data, but it's about data that somehow you, we can't kind of control in some ways. And I've been thinking a lot about, I actually was the editor on a paper, not in an AEA journal, just a, an ordinary um, a referee job recently. And in seeing the paper for a revision, the editor of the paper, actually called the authors out as doing an RCT, not really having a pre-analysis plan. Um, they had submitted some materials and the, and the editor was actually holding the authors to account on how the paper differed from what was in their kind of nascent pre-analysis plan. And it started me to think whether or not a next step that the AEA could engage in would be in setting up a RCT editor, you know, in the same way that 
this would be more like on the front end of um, analyzing papers uh, rather than when they're accepted. Um, and um, I think we're kind of at a point where it would be good to have some reflection about whether and to what extent the actions that we've taken at the AEA have um, you know, led to changes um, outside our journals. So, um, oh, I said, there's one other thing on the list that I've been thinking about. Um, a, a funder that I was, a foundation that I was involved in uh, pushed me to write a pre-analysis plan for a quasi-experimental paper, which I had never done before. And I, it was difficult, and but very useful. And, um, I, and I think it'll be interesting to see how that part of open science uh, pre-registration evolves over time in the bigger domain outside of randomized control trials. So thank you. Thank you, Hillary. Um, yeah, I guess at the at the very end, we're back into how does this go back and forth between our institutions and the discipline, uh, some of that organizational aspect of it that, that uh, Kim also brought back up. Um, so um, we're now joined by uh, Betsy Sinclair. Betsy, I already introduced you a bit earlier. Uh, thank you for finding the time to, to, uh, to join us here. Um, so um, let me throw the ball your way. You have been and still are a member of various editorial boards, but again, I, I want to have the emphasis here to, to some extent on the disciplines behind those uh, journals that are, that are out there in political science including uh, the American Journal of Political Science, which was one of the uh, earlier adopters of verification of, of reproducibility of articles. Um, similar to the question that I started Hillary of, uh, off with, uh, but you weren't there yet, so let me repeat that, was that decision to emphasize reproducibility and to some extent transparency of the research, of the uh, qualitative, uh, the quantitative research process, was that emanating from a consensus within the discipline or was that uh, a sort of leadership decision amongst uh, the members of that society? Um, so we, we've just discussed this with Hillary in economics. So what, what's the situation in political science? Thank you for the question and thank you for your patience while I finish my search committee meeting. Um, so I, you know, I think there's a lot of space for innovation in the questions of um, reproducibility and, and replication. And so, it, you know, in, instead of talking, I suppose, specifically about the adoption process for the AJPS, I wanna talk about a different journal um, and how we've basically wrestled with that publication process in a more, um, I think, nuanced way and but are continuing to struggle with because it's one that's a more technical, um, journal in a lot of ways. And so I think um, is going to touch on some of the concerns that um, uh, were just mentioned in terms of what's the next frontier. And that's the Journal of Political Analysis. So I'm the current president of the Society of uh, Political Methodology, which is the primary academic society for the use of computational social science in political science. So we do lots of modeling. We do some RCTs. Um, we do lots of questions of measurement. And so I think um, because it's at the frontier of computation for my field, we've really had a tension between three different kinds of work. And I think it's worth highlighting those, like where we are with that process right now, um, you know, as a society and with our journal, and then to try to think about where political science is falling on, in terms of those three key issues. And so one is just transparency. So we were early adopters of the requirement that all data and code be added to a replication archive um, and that the paper be reproducible. And with that assumption um, comes the requirement that the editorial team has the capabilities to do that. And what we've increasingly seen is necessary for that uh, process to occur has been a subscription to CodeOcean. So we're increasingly seeing the compute resources necessary to be able to engage in that replication are tremendous. And so I think trying to think about, you know, who bears the burden of that and who has expertise to be able to engage in those things. This is more than just storing, storing data to be able to replicate the code is hard. And the second was just touched on, which is then how do you handle proprietary data? So in the case, for example, if someone is going to look at all the tweets issued by all members of Congress for the last decade, 
um, you know, you can't just make a public replication archive of all of that data. You could, for example, create code to say, here are the Twitter handles and here is the link to the API and here is how you use those Twitter handles to pull the data from the API. Um, but at some point you're engaging in a process of replication that becomes quite burdensome and is sometimes engaged in the process of proprietary data. And, and I think this, this second step becomes pretty important in trying to think about how it is that we move forward as a science. Um, and the third also has to do with RCTs. So we also ask for randomized trials um, and studies more broadly, really, to be pre-registered if possible. And, um, you know, we, we offer a whole host of opportunities for people to, to pre-register their studies. Um, so there's the Political Science Registered Studies Database, um, the American Economic Association's RCT Registry, um, which just got mentioned, um, and one that's near and dear to my heart, which has been the Experiments in Government and um, Governance and Politics Registry, which is called EGAP, um, which has really been working at the frontier of, um, you know, where we can do this kind of develop more can make sure we're getting the registries and the pre-registration files right. Now, in each of those spaces, there's been, a, I think, like some nuance. And so one of the things I think that we have really struggled with as a journal is to try to think about how, um, how we allow authors to um, opt into these policies to allow maximum transparency in the research process, but also acknowledge that not every single paper is going to fit in every single possible bin. So some of the journals in my field now require pre-registration. We haven't required pre-registration. We're simply asking for it. So we ask if you have pre-registered that you send that information to the editors, make sure that information is anonymous and can be sent into the reviewers. And when a paper is published, it's included as a note. Um, the the similar moment here of like you must submit the data like so there must be this replication um but if you have proprietary data we still have a process for it and it is the case that we would still consider a paper published that had not been pre-registered and i like those norms i have to say and i, I think it puts me sometimes at odds with this community that's going to require all things for all people um just because i think it acknowledges the possibility that there should sometimes be exceptions but we should push ourselves towards like the best kinds of transparency policy possible. I think this has been an interesting um, place to, you know, converge. And it's a fun conversation to have with economists because you could imagine, you could say, well, won't the authors be a little bit strategic and whether or not they do this kind of pre-registration. Pre and I think it's why communities like this um, that emerge to talk about these values as scholarly values for getting the truth right become so incredibly important um, just in terms of, of where we are and where we're going. Um, and so I suppose I, I will close because I think I answered a large question um, and just say, like, I'm, I'm really happy to be part of this conversation. Thank you, Betsy. Um, beyond that last point, there, there was a, um, an interesting comment from, um, so we're, we're seeing reproducibility requirements, transparency requirements emerging at other journals as well, not just the top journals in econ. And one of the comments from one of the editors was, I really don't want to be that last journal that adopted and ending up with, quote unquote, the dregs uh, that don't reproduce. Um, so there, there is an element here of reflecting where the, um, the community, the discipline goes and what it deems acceptable, but there's also a transition period. Transitions might be eternal, I guess. Uh, I don't know, we might converge to something, but uh, in infinity only. Um, but uh, th that's, I think, where the interesting back and forth come from is this idea of how do we actually tackle these challenges and, and solve them. Um, let me launch the discussion among here. Um, one common aspect that has come up, whether it's with a qualitative one or uh, Hillary's work with the uh, Commission on Evidence-Based Policymaking that has to struggle with the idea of how do you access confidential data, and, and, and Betsy just mentioned that as well in, in terms of data that are hard to access. They're, they're not always confidential. They might be proprietary. They might be transient, those kinds of things. Um, what, what do the various disciplines right now uh, do in terms of moving the body of researchers towards that, right? There's old habits about doing this. Yep, it's mine. It's stuck somewhere on my computer. Uh, here's what, approximately what I did, and let's, let's move forward on that, to a more transparent state of the discipline that says, Okay, maybe here's here's all the code. 
uh, and at least as data editor, I no longer see people saying, I can't give you the code because the data is confidential, which often was the case in the past. Um, and the sense of proprietary data, one of the answers to that, to, to Kim's question was, what do you do with that? Well, one of it is a, a sense of property that gets respected. So if one were to actually cite data, would that relinquish some of those holding on to the data because the only way I can get credit for the data I've collected is by holding on to it and publishing papers. If I were to be able to get cited for it, why would I get similar credit and that interacts with a lot of other things that are key to the disciplines, credit as in tenure decisions about producing data rather than papers and things like that. So launching that serve as a, as a general idea, these things intersect, but where are the disciplines moving along? We've got journals that are at the tip of the frontier are we dragging the disciplines along? So I'll answer for sociology since I think um, my mute button is the only one that's off right at the moment. I mean, I think that it has been, uh, it's incredibly bottom up in the sense that it's really been um, driven by either individual researchers or small teams of researchers. And here I put the sociological science team on that. Um, to try and push the discipline forward. So there's certainly folks who are working in the social psychology space who are basically saying, you know, I'm gonna, I believe in this rep this uh, pre-registration and I'm just gonna do it, um, even though I'm not required to do it. Um, you know, you have similar things going on in the in the computational space and in the um, you know, digital trace data space, um, similar concerns with proprietary data too, you know, purchasing a big data set from somewhere. Um, but I think that that there has been kind of a an absence of leadership at the center um, for reasons that I think have to do with the ASA and its relative lack of funding compared to, compared to the AEA for sure. Um, and in that, in that vacuum, I think individual researchers are pushing that and um, increasingly training their graduate students. Um, I mean, I think that's actually a really, you know, a positive development in, in the field. Um, but right at the moment, it's all over the place and it's, it really is uh, honor system slash voluntary um, and I think that, you know, it could be that it just takes one leader at the American Sociological Association to say, look, this is, we're going to do this, you know, we're going to, I'm going to, that's going to be my platform is to, to bring sociology back into the, um, at least a little bit closer to be on par with, with, uh, poli sci and, and economics and so forth. So far that hasn't, that person hasn't come along. Um, but you know, that, that is where I see kind of the biggest hope for, real sort of centralized change um, as opposed to the individual efforts that are going on right now. I keep thinking there is a huge difference between reproducibility and replication. Yes. And so I find it like, I think it is very important that we store data and code. And I am so grateful for so many people who are spending so many long hours ensure, ensuring that the findings are reproducible. But I think really as a field, we really haven't meaningfully grappled with it, what it, replication means. And there are a lot of questions that challenge our kind of positivist you know, philosophies of science, really, if we think hard about what replication means. You know, I think these questions about um, you know, state to pate in terms of estimating causal effects, in terms of trying to think about the generalizability of our findings, in terms of having a science that transcends time. Um, like these are really big questions to be asking. And a lot of times we are not asking those questions. We are simply asking, did you write out your code in the right way? And I think like we should not be satisfied as a science with those first set of questions. Like I would like us to be asking both questions in a more aggressive way. I think it's really important that we can reproduce the findings that are in journals, that code is accessible and that data is accessible to the greatest extent. But I don't think that's enough. Right. Hillary? Yeah, um, there's a lot in that question and in this conversation. So I'll pull out a, a few threads. Um, the next generation, I, I think we are, I think there is an effect on the next generation. Um, are we pulling the discipline along? Some parts of it, but more effectively than others. I do just see my students um, who, it's just a part of their workflow. And it's it's the expectation that you know that, you, that you're gonna need to have your build code streamlined and ready to go. And they think about that and they, um, 
make improvements along the way, I think. Whereas, you know, old dinosaurs like me, it's like at the end, you're like, oh crap, now I have to really like clean things up and turn my 10 build code, you know, just like make it more user-friendly. It's a small point, but I do think that the fact that what we're requiring now at many journals and certainly a large share of the top journals, I do think has just sort of changed what people know that they're going to have to do, or, and they certainly hope that, you know, some other papers end up in those, in those top journals. So I do think it makes a difference over time. Um, replication um, versus reproducibility. I think economics is terrible at this. We give it no, um, you know, it's not valued in, you know, we're always looking for the new shiny thing, not showing that the shiny thing that Lars did is actually still shiny over here or the context, the, the, the um, ex, how generally um, applicable it is. I think that is a, I, I don't think we've made any progress on that whatsoever. Uh, possibly the most positive thing I could say about that is that because so much of data is available, people are just getting to work. And so I do think that the sort of barriers to entry are lower. And I, I believe that that will improve the amount of replication that's going on. But I don't see that it's changed the value that it is um, given in the discipline. Um, and I don't think people see those things in the same conversation. Um, I mean, I yeah. mean, part of it is when I usually talk about it, I think of it as transparency more so than reproducibility, right? Mm. Um, I see this as building stones um, for, uh, it's, 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 it's a big Lego set out there. And if I can figure out how to actually run that complicated Twitter thing from the code that actually did run it, and I can re-implement it again, but I can ask a different question about it, I am contributing to making replication or a completely different study available because, because of that. Um, uh, so I, I agree with, with Betsy that this is not just about, oh, this code ran once. It's the next step then is, well, that means that those results were produced once. Do they hold up? And actually, there are studies that are, I seem, I don't have data on this. Uh, there's not enough of these, but that actually use reproducible code to then investigate the methods that are in a bunch of journals. That is replication, that is robustness check at scale. And mm. those become feasible because of some of the buildings. So that's just one aspect of it, right? But that enables the bigger question. Here's 15 papers that studied this question using this method. But what if that method is not robust and let's try this other thing out, right? To do that, you need to be investigate, to able to investigate the entire literature for that. So I think those things are happening. They tend to be happening with people that are younger, say, than me. Um, and, and, and so uh, we'll, I, I have hope that the discipline is moving us along, pushing us along as well in that. Um, I can just add two comments yeah. to that. So there's um, just a, a data point about sociological science. When we were, when we were developing the journal, we intentionally said um, studies that are replicating other findings are welcome. You know, we really want this. We're trying to encourage it. Um, I don't have a careful count um, because I didn't necessarily see all submissions, but I would say in seven years, we've probably published like three of those. I um, mean, it's not because we're rejecting them. It's because they're just not coming in, right? So it's this value, what's valued in the field. Um, it's just not, that message is just not out there quite yet. What you're, um, what you're being told by seniors is what should be valued. And, and then you get, you know, reviewer two says, well, these findings aren't novel enough. And then you're, you know, there goes six months of your life, right? So um, the other thing that I wanted to mention is sort of some interesting experiments that um, Matt Selganik has been involved with, with and others um, that really basically taking a given data set and asking a whole bunch of different researcher teams a question about that data set, um, and then essentially having each researcher team uh, devise a model and generate results um, that supposedly answer the question, um, and then really trying to triangulate from that and see, you know, what can we really learn if we have, say, 50 different researcher teams who are at, trying to answer exactly the same question with the same data? Um, by the way, it didn't 
work out very well. It turns out that um, we didn't learn a lot of new things from that exercise, except that um, researchers vary and it's really hard to draw conclusions from a data set, right? Okay, we, we knew that already, but it's kind of an interesting um, experiment and, and, and way of thinking about um, how you can move science forward and, and um, what works and what doesn't work when you're actually trying to get at quote unquote, the truth, assuming you agree that there's truth out there, which not all sociologists do. Um, I do want to get back a bit to the to the idea of um, while our students are um, being encouraged by us to some extent to sort of move forward with these new practices, um, and 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 I already mentioned this. How do we think that this can actually be valued at scale within our disciplines? Are there are do you guys see shifts in actually working on a replication study or actually working a significant chunk of some of one's academic time on a data set creation process or something like that, that builds infrastructure or data infrastructure that can be used by dozens, hundreds, others to actually improve science, but you're uh, the one that actually put it together. Is that kind of credit emerging in the sort of discussion? Yeah, Betsy, you just came out of a a discussion with 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 deans in a new institute or something like that. Are those kinds of things discussed in those uh, scenarios? I mean, um, you know, we were having a very complicated discussion about the frontiers of statistics and data science in that previous meeting. But I wanted to say, I think there's actually tremendous movement on this. And I'm really encouraged by the fact that um, in political science, increasingly, our top journals are permitting submissions of, of projects at the state of when you have the pre-analysis plan and the experiment is not yet run. And I really would like to highlight what EGAP is doing as an organization because I think it is the this incredibly um, fruitful frontier. They ask for um, uh, experimental plans to be written up and submitted before the experiment has been run. Um, and then you go and present it to a conference of your peers where the expectation is that every participant in those conferences will have read the work ahead of time. So they are, they are talks with no slides. Um, and, and that's pretty rare for, for us as an, as an academic community to have a talk with no slides. Um, the expectation being the audience has already done all of the work ahead of time. So you give just a you know, two minute brief and then off you go. You dive into this proposal, you work on it very hard. And at that point, you have written something up that our journals will now accept before the results have come in. And I think that is the space of innovation. So like, I just think that there are, um, you know, tremendous possibilities here in terms of how it is that we understand where science happens. And so I think, um, you know, recognizing that you could accept a paper for publication in a top journal without knowing what the data actually look like based upon the quality of the design is I think a pretty exciting space and especially giving a forum for researchers to share that information with a broader, you know, intellectual community, it raises the bar for all of our science. And, and so I think that's really where we need to be moving in terms of in terms of this this process is to say like we don't need to know what the findings are and it takes away some of the concerns that we have in terms of you know p hacking for example like we're not only looking for the you know the, the findings that we're we want we're looking for the designs that let us test the hypotheses that are that are we are most curious about and, and I like that idea a lot that doesn't work on secondary use data. So that just uh, does all the historical use of the GSS is now done. Uh, we just have to wait for the next one and pre-register all the, the questions, I guess. Um, or we just use some really big data where everybody just has one stab at it and it just needs to be perfectly programmed up and run it through. No, that's why I like what political analysis does, not one size fits all. So like, you know, there are lots of lots of paths to truth. I think what Kim said about sociologists is pretty true and different than political science. Like we tend to think things are generalizable. We're pretty positivist for the most part. Sociologists aren't all that way. And so I think, most you know, fair enough. But like, yes. you know, I think there's there's so that so I think there should be room at the table for some dialogue about how you know what is true. Um, and, and I think there's there's there should be a way for you to still publish, a, you know, a meta analysis of all the GSS studies moving forwards, because there should be many paths to getting this right. And I think that's why being a social scientist is so exciting. That's that's the fun. I actually did um, see a, a, a paper across my desk recently that was a pre-registered study of the census. 
Um, and it was essentially, you know, here's what I'm going to look at. Here's what the measures I'm going to use. Here's how I'm going to how I'm going to coat these different variables, um, which I thought was actually this was a fairly young scholar, I think a, a relatively new assistant professor. I was actually really encouraged by that, um, you know, sort of not kind of balkanizing experimental work and saying, well, here's this this tool that is great for experimental works, but it has no relevance for us. He was really saying, no, I mean, you know, if I'm going to analyze the census. I shouldn't be able to dig around and try and find, you know, how you uh, map census tracts across time in ways that are going to give me the p the number of stars after my p-value that I want, right? Um, so I I was actually really encouraged by that. I think it's a great development. Yeah, yeah. I I think one of the ways where I see again reproducibility as contributing to transparency of these kinds of things is that um, it's really hard to understand data in a way that actually makes that tightly linked rather than approximately linked, um, right? The, the story earlier about uh, a pre-registration that isn't and tightly enough linked to the article is in part a function of it's actually hard to sort of say, here's what the data will look like until you understand the data that hasn't been collected yet. Um, that is a, a skill that can in part be contributed to by some of our code archives and stuff like that, because here, hey, here's how we did the last one. And somebody will come up with a compatibility map or whatever it is, and I can just try it out on the old one. And then when the new one comes out, my pre-registered analysis actually might, might work. Um, that's where I see at least one, one additional contribution as well. Um, Hillary? Yeah. yeah, I was thinking about what you were saying about whether or not we're along a path whereby people would feel comfortable spending time developing data assets with the expectation that there would be some, you know, um, professional value, you know, that's derived from that. And I'm just not convinced that that's the case. I think it's very uneven. I think it takes resources because I think people don't see it as substituting for the value of writing papers and getting them out. And so then I think what you see is some teams with a lot of resources um, dedicate efforts, you know, after they've written the big paper to put out some um, disclosable data. Um, I'm thinking about the Opportunity Insights team in particular is kind of taking this approach that is ultimately originally confidential data, say analysis of tax data, but allowed disclosable units, you know, transition matrices of migration flows based on different income, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, percentile, something of that sort. And you do see that data used a lot. It's rich enough, it's well thought out enough, and it's in a space where we know our, our knowledge is still relatively young, that you do see a lot of papers being written on those data. But you don't, it's, how, I was thinking about how they're cited, Lars. I was thinking about, they're not cited in the same, I don't know, it's not obvious to me that it's how it's connected back to what individuals, you know, kind of citations are. So I'm not sure about that. I, this isn't really part of the conversation that we're having, but I can't help but say that I think in economics, one of the things that's kind of generally in this space that I'm deeply concerned about our issues maybe around data equity. And we've sort of gotten to the point where having novel data is like a very important ingredient for publishing a paper in a top journal. And that unfortunately is a very valuable thing. I think that's a conversation for another day. But so I think then what you see is people really racing for this kind of like land grab or gold rush to make sure that you can get new data in order to speak to a question. And I worry about the lack of an unequal playing field. Um, and I think as we move forward with making more of our kind of traditional administrative data at the federal government level available or at the state level, I hope that that's gonna create more um, data equity. Because I think it's a very important aspect of um, academic, academic, um, economic research in a lot of domains right now. I love okay. what Hillary just said. So, a hundred percent agree. Um, I think that 
especially as we think about um, like where the field is going moving forward, I think there's one other thing to touch on, which is that of data ethics. And I think most of the social sciences did not do a very good job thinking hard about the questions of data ethics. And as, you know, especially as we collect this data, how we think about how we report back to the populations over which we have conducted these RCTs, like where those obligations are, you know, trying to think hard about those processes. Those aren't usually part of our PhD training. And I think there's a lot of opportunity there to do better. Okay. Um, I unfortunately need to take one of Hillary's other comments at, at, at Word, uh, namely that's a discussion for another day because we're at time. Um, so I would actually love to have that conversation another day. I'll get back to you guys on what the next round of, of webinars is. Uh, but thank you all for, for joining us. Um, uh, thank you all uh, for to the panelists for, for having been part of this uh, very interesting discussion. Um, I want to... Uh, say that the next session is uh, a month from now on February 28th at our usual time at 4.15. We're gonna talk about how journal reproducibility verification services work, um, including those in political science journals, but also outside of uh, uh, the uh, journal world. Um, so join us then as always, uh, the link to register is on our website. So thank you all for coming and come back in a month.